Here we're going to take a look at partial pressure and water vapor and how are those two related to each other. Well, let's say for example we have a little cup with water and we seal it off with a larger container that contains air and so what happens now is that this water is exposed to the air and water molecules will dissociate themselves from the water in the cup here and mix with the air and in some cases some of the water molecules will come back from the air and, and uh, go back into the cup of water. So you have constant water vapor coming off the water, water vapor going back into the water, back and forth like that. But if the air is not saturated, in other words, if it holds less moisture than it can, and that depends on its temperature, then more water molecules will go into the air and less water molecules will come back. Eventually, when equilibrium is reached, the partial pressure of water vapor is, and we'll get into that in just a moment, but when equilibrium is reached, that means that the same number of water molecules are going both directions so that we're not adding more to the air. The air is now what we call saturated. We have now reached what we call the partial pressure of water vapor. And what does that mean? Well, if you measure the partial pressure of the various constituents in the air, you'll find out, whoop, just dropped my pen here, uh, you'll find out that part of that pressure is due to the water vapor in the air. At zero degrees centigrade, if the air is fully saturated, the partial pressure of the moisture or the water vapor in the air will be 4.58 millimeters of mercury, which is a very small percentage of the total pressure, let's say on one atmosphere. So at zero degrees centigrade, let's divide 4.58 divided by 760 because that's the number of millimeters of mercury of atmospheric pressure. So you can see that 4.58 divided by 760 is less than 1%. That is equal to 0 0.6, well, let's call, call it 0.6%. At, let's say, 20 degrees centigrade, we have a partial pressure of 17.54 divided by 760, which is equal to, and let's do that, 17.54 divided by 760 equals, and now we're talking about 2.3%. So at 20 degrees centigrade, in a situation like this, where we're allowed, where water is, uh, water is allowed to evaporate into an enclosed environment like that, it will continue doing that until the air is fully saturated water at 20 degrees centigrade, means that 2.3% by pressure or by volume would be water vapor. The hotter it is, the more moisture the air can contain. For example, at 30 degrees centigrade, it's almost double that. So that would be almost 4% of, of the air can be moisture and so forth. And notice when you get all the way to 100 degrees centigrade, this will just continue until the total partial pressure of water vapor, 760 um, millimeters of mercury, which would mean 100% water vapor. That's, of course, never going to happen. We're not in a situation where that is possible. But if you take water and you continue boiling it in a very small closed environment, you'll push more and more of this water vapor into the air and you'll reach a higher and higher saturation point. All right, so what does that mean in chemistry? Well, that means that in certain experiments where we collect gas, for example, like this, this is called collecting gas over water. We're doing some sort of experiment here where we're doing a reaction where gas is released and the gas is therefore pushed through the tube and then released inside this upside down uh, cup. And more and more gas is being collected, and so as the pressure builds and is then equal to the atmospheric pressure, as more and more gas goes in here, the water will then get pushed out and will collect more and more gas into this container. Now, however, since this is water in here, so this is H2O, at a particular temperature, let's say a temperature 20 degrees centigrade, it will evaporate into that container as well, and part of the pressure in here will not just be due to the gas that we're collecting, but also due to the water vapor that's evaporating. And the higher the temperature of that water and the air in there, the, the greater the amount of water that will evaporate. So let's say we're doing some collection and we're collecting helium and neon gas in this particular container. And let's say that we know that the partial pressure of helium is 300 millimeters of mercury, then what would be the partial pressure of neon gas? So the way we do that is that the total pressure is equal to the pressure due to the neon gas plus the pressure due to the helium gas plus the partial pressure of the water vapor. We have to take it all into account. And since we're looking for the partial pressure of neon, we can then say that the partial pressure of neon is equal to the total pressure, let's call this total pressure, 
minus the two other ones that go to the other side, so minus the pressure of helium, minus the pressure of water vapor. So now, total pressure, let's say we're at one atmosphere, that would be equal to 760 millimeters of mercury, of HD, like that, for the total pressure. From that, we subtract the partial pressure of helium, which we were told was 300 millimeters. So it'll be 300 millimeters of mercury minus the partial pressure of the water vapor. And assuming that it's fully saturated at 20 degrees centigrade, how much is that? At 20 degrees centigrade, it accounts for 17.5 millimeters. So this is called 17.5. Oh, there we go. Mm, that's not a very good one there. 17.5 millimeters of mercury. So if we subtract all of that from 760, what do we get? So we get 760 minus 300 and minus 17.5. We end up with only 442.5 millimeters. That's equal to 442.5 millimeters of neon gas. So that's a partial pressure of neon. So notice that we do have to take that into account in more ways than one. Here's one example. When we collect gases over water, part of the pressure that makes up in the collected gas will also be the water vapor that evaporates into that environment. And that's how we look at partial pressure and water vapor.